Before we get to this tragic case, I wanted to send out our thoughts and prayers to the loved ones and friends of Kelly Clayton. Today's case is bringing us to Elmira, New York. It has a population of about 26,000 souls that live there. It has lots of parks, boating, swimming, fishing, and if you want to pack up and go have a picnic, you can do that too. Many who live there and others that just visit can enjoy the summer concerts also. Even though the crime rate is a bit high, it doesn't stop many people from moving there. Stage was born on August 1st, 1980. She was raised in Amira to her parents Elizabeth and Howard Stage. Kelly was the youngest of three, her older sister Kim and her brother Lenny. Their father Howard sadly had died unexpectedly in 2012. He was a fire chief over 20 years. Kelly's sister who was 10 years older, always had tried to keep a close eye out on her baby sister. They were very close growing up. Now Kelly, she loved playing on the softball team. Also, she made it into the cheerleading squad. Kelly was a fitness guru. She loved Pilates. And then as you exhale, extend the spine and lift up. Awesome, Kelly. Kelly, growing up, had big dreams that matched her big personality, said one of her best friends, Andrea. She wanted to go to Las Vegas, and she got a job teaching. Then she went to work at a cocktail waitress at the Imperial Palace. Even though she really did love working there, but she really missed her family back home. So she left and moved back. Her mother and sister, Kim, had made plans to go to the local hockey team. And this is where Kelly had saw a handsome hockey player that was in the team. The semi-pro Elmira Jackals. He was known for having a reputation of fighting on the ice and flirting off of it. His name was Tom Scott Clayton. Superheroes are coming to First Arena this Friday night on and off the ice. Your Elmira Jackals push for the playoffs continues this weekend at First Arena versus the Manchester Monarchs. Thomas was born on March 17, 1978 in Binghamton, New York. This is about an hour's drive away from Elmira. Now as Tom was growing up, he was into sports and he loved it. He had attended Niagara University in Buffalo. Now, hockey was Tom's life, his dream. He wanted to go pro in the NHL. He had went to semi-pro on the ice. Then he had played forward. And after he had graduated, he signed up with the Elmira Jackals. It's a minor league hockey team. The Elmira Jackals are no longer a lead though. Their last game was in 2017. Get one of their top guys off the ice for two minutes, five minutes, you know, it's, it's a job done. When you want to drop you want to fight someone. Just like when you're a little kid and you get so mad you just want to fight, you know? Now, if any of you watch hockey, know that old saying, I was watching a fight and a game broke out. Now, Tom loved to be the enforcer. He would always be in a fight or two on the ice, and he was known to be a real hothead. As much as Tom had caught Kelly's eye, Kelly had caught his too. She did like the kind of bad boy image that Tom had. 
They had fallen in love and dated a number of years. Then they got married in 2006. And they had two beautiful children. A girl named Charlie and a son, and they named him Colin. Tom had left hockey in 2006 due to he could not get into the pros. He had applied multiple times and was rejected, so he retired from hockey. Then he started his own business with a friend of his named Brian. They named it Surf Pro Restoration. They would renovate water damage, mold, that sort of thing. Then they had bought a home in 2012. It's a heavily wooded area off of Ginnon Road. This is where they would call home. On the outside, it looked as though they had it all. They had a great friends, beautiful family. Kelly had worked waiting tables, and they also were landlords for a couple houses they had rented out just for some extra cash. Kelly did have a best friend from school. Her name is Andrea, who had been her bestie for years and was like part of the family. Kelly's 16-year-old niece had gotten a job working at Tom's business at the Surf Pro. It was on the early morning of September 29th, 2015. This Monday night, Kelly had gone to bed after putting her kids to sleep and locking up the house. Now Tom was at his Monday night weekly poker game with his good friends, the Millers. Kelly was woken about approximately 11.30 p.m. by being struck in the head with a blunt object. The first hit was supposed to render her unconscious, but it didn't. She had jumped up, pushed the intruder off of her, and ran. She was yelling for her seven-year-old daughter to run. She then had shut the daughter's door to the room and ran downstairs where the intruder had bludgeoned her to death in the kitchen. All while her daughter had come out of her room, hearing her mother scream, she had went downstairs and saw her mother being beaten by a man. After the man had left, Charlie went over to her mother. And while she, her mother was still barely hanging on and alive, she had hugged her mama for a while. Then Charlie had got up, went to take care of her younger brother. They hid, waiting for somebody to come home was just after midnight on September 29th. Tom had left and went home. As he entered the house, he had found his wife dead on the kitchen floor, all bloody. Then he dialed 911. 911. Help me, help me, my wife. She's dead. Hurry. Okay, just stay on the line with me. How long has she been down? I don't know. I don't know. I just got home. So you need to calm down so I can help you. What's your name? When this Tom, she'd be on CPR. Yes. Sir, can you tell me why you think she's beyond CPR? That's not me. The police had arrived and found the two kids, and they were both traumatized, especially the little seven-year-old girl, Charlie, who had witnessed her mama being brutally attacked. How you doing? I'm okay. What's going on? Um, I'm just came, I'm the neighbor. Okay. He just came and got me out of bed. There's, what? There's, he's right in the house. Okay, what happened? His wife, his wife is in. As the police started to see what happened, they saw blood trail from Kelly's bedroom down the hall to her daughter's room. Then the trail ended in the kitchen. Got blood on the wall, blood on the steps. The attacker was chasing her the entire time. Her face had been beaten in and was a bloody mess. Right away, the arriving officers were suspicious of Tom. Tom, where were you when this all went down? I told everybody. I came home and my daughter said there was a robber in the house and she saw that. Okay, come on out here, man. Come on out here. I want you to have a seat. You don't need to see that anymore, okay? All right. Come on. I get that water. Yeah, we'll get you water. Take it easy, bud. Take it easy. Come on over here, Tom. I'm just gonna. You're not in trouble, okay? I'm just gonna have you have a seat so we can talk to you. All right. Take it easy. You're not in trouble. Just sit right there. I'm gonna leave the door open. Just sit right there and relax. The police had got Tom out of the house as protocol to preserve the crime scene. Tom had been questioned 
not as a suspect, but to find out who could have done this to his wife and why. Tama told them that he was at the poker game that evening, and he did this every week. Even though he did have a strong alibi, the police still had their hunches that he might have done this to her somehow. As the detectives had investigated the crime scene, they had said that there was not a robbery because nothing had been taken. There was no signs of forced entry into the home. However, the garage door was open. To the investigators, the sole purpose was to take Kelly's life and spare the children. As the detectives had questioned Tom, Tom had told them that he had a GPS on his truck that tracks his every movement and also his phone too. As the police looked at Tom to see if there was any blood at all on him, there was nothing, nothing at all, not on his clothes or shoes. The police had searched the pond out back and they even had drained it and they had looked all around the area for any kind of evidence. They had questioned everyone around the area to see if anyone could have saw something or heard something. Being out in the rural area, no one heard any of the screams. Asking friends and family, they had told the police that Kelly did not have any enemies. No one would want her dead. The police had went to her work to see if anyone or maybe a customer she had a problem with. And everyone had said that she was a great person and no one had it out for her. There was no motive to her murder. They had brought in Charlie to see if she could tell them about the person that she saw. She had first been interviewed by Jim Allard and he had said that her story begins that she was in her room playing on her tablet. She heard mommy yell, run Charlie, run. And mommy got her door closed. Then she heard more commotion. She opened it, went into the hallway down the stairs and into the kitchen. She observed mommy fighting with the man and she had said it was a robber. She saw the person striking her mommy on the ground. We brought you here today? Okay. We're going to have to talk a little bit about last night. Okay. When asked, she said that the robber looked like her dad. Then the investigator had said, did the man was as tall as him? And she said, it looked like her dad. Jim then asked her, was the man as big as me? She said, he looked like her dad. With any question that Jim had asked, it was the same answer. It looked like her dad. This guy came and said, hey, my mom looks like this type for me. He looks like my dad. And, and why do you say that? How did he look like your dad? The mask and his shoes. The investigators had went over to the Miller's house to verify if Tom was there. As the detectives arrived, knocked on the door. By now, it was around six in the morning. When the Millers got up to answer, the first thing that they thought was when the police was there, something must have happened to their daughters. Maybe they got into a car accident. The police said nothing was wrong with their daughters at all, but they did want to question them about a guy that was nicknamed Hockey Puck. This is the nickname that everyone called him at the poker games. The Millers did tell the police that he was there playing poker and what time that he left. When the Millers had questioned the police about why they're asking about Hockey Puck, the police had said Tom went home and found his wife murdered. They both were in shock that Greg and his wife Linda did give the officers all the details of the night before that there was nothing out of the ordinary. Now Tom did have a strong alibi of where he was that night. There were many players at the poker game and the Millers had saw him and that he did leave around 1230. The investigators knew from the autopsy that Kelly was murdered around 11.30 p.m. As the investigators looked more closely at Tom's background, they did find out that he did have a gambling addiction and was deep in debt. And also, he did have many affairs. 
When Kelly's niece, Molly, was being interviewed, she had said when she was working with Tom that he confided to her about the problem in his marriage to her aunt. He was not very happy that he had been having affairs with other women. She had told the police that he had fallen out of love with Kelly and that she became very lazy. Tom had also told Molly, 16 at the time, he had told her to stay away from Michael Beard. He was working at the Surf Pro Restoration also until he was fired weeks before Kelly's murder for stealing. He was also one had rented one of the homes from Tom and Kelly. Before Kelly's murder, he had been over to their home many times that Kelly had even given Michael some of the old clothes from her kids to give it to him for his kids. Many thought that maybe he could be a disgruntled employee, maybe getting revenge. They had brought in Michael for questioning. As they spoke to him, he had denied any involvement in what had happened to Kelly. When the detectives had asked him if he knew Tom, he told them he really didn't know him that well. Now, Michael had been very cooperative. He even gave him his cell phone and his DNA was only the next day they did arrest Tom for Kelly's murder. Even though he had a rock solid alibi, he was 15 minutes away. But with Tom's daughter, Charlie, being a witness and saying that the man looked like her dad, it was probable cause to make an arrest. The investigation into the night with Tom at the poker game, he did ask his good friend Linda Miller to use her cell phone to make a call. He said he left his cell phone out in the car, that he had to call work. So without thinking, she said okay and handed him her phone. Also, the police had found out that he had doubled Kelly's life insurance to $1 million without her knowing it. Now, even though Tom had many affairs, he had confided to them if Kelly and him would split up and got a divorce that she would wind up taking everything from him. After the police had left the Millers, Greg and Linda had started talking and thinking, how could someone murder Kelly and why? When they heard the next day that he had been charged with the murder of Kelly, they were once again in shock and wondering how he could have been there at the house the whole time with them. And now he's being charged with murder, knowing she was murdered at 1130 and Tom was there at the house at that time playing poker. As the Millers started talking, Linda remembered that Tom did ask her to use her cell phone to make a call to his work. She had got a hold of the phone and started to look through the call logs and they all had been erased. So they had called the others that had been there that night at the poker game, asked them, did Tom have his phone on him? And they all said yes, they remember him having his phone on the table. So the Millers knew that it was not in the car as he said he was, that he had asked to use her phone, but why and who did he call? Both Greg and Linda Miller kept digging into what the number did he call. They had got Linda's cell phone records for that night, and sure enough, the number Tom had dialed, and he had called it twice. The time of the call was an hour before the murder of Kelly. Now, the Millers did not recognize the number, and they did hand it over to the investigator, Donnie Lewis. When Donnie Lewis had got the number, he had went on Facebook, put the number in, and the profile that popped up was Michael Beard, the same Michael Beard that had been cooperative with the investigators. With checking the phone records, the investigators have found out that there were many calls and text messages that was made between Tom and Michael. After the call from Tom, the police did locate the cell phone of Michael and he left. They had spoke with Michael's girlfriend, and she did remember that Tom did offer her boyfriend $10,000 to set fire to his home. He had decided not to set the fire due to the children were inside. He did not want to hurt the children. So he decided to go and just kill Kelly only. As they confronted Michael with all the evidence they had, he did finally come clean and he told them that Tom had given him the keys to the house. He had entered the home through the garage. Then he had showed them where he had disposed of the keys, his clothes, and the murder weapon that he used. It was a handle of an ax, not the blade, just the handle. 
Michael also told them that he did not make any money up front to do it, that he did trust Tom to pay him after the job was done. They both were charged for the murder of Kelly. The investigators also charged a man named Mark. He was the lookout, but he didn't have any involvement in the murder. After the arrest, Tom did make bail. It was one year after the murder that Michael had went on trial. Michael Beard told investigators Thomas Clayton offered him $10,000 to kill Kelly Stage Clayton. From a series of voluntary interviews with Beard, the days following Kelly's death, investigators say Beard became emotional after failing a polygraph test. Beard told investigators he knew where the murder weapon was. While the trial was going on, he did recount everything that he had said to the investigators, that the deal was to set fire to the house. He did not even do that and he did not kill anyone. His new story now was that he was only hired to set fire to the house. When he arrived, he saw there was somebody murdering Kelly. Then the person who was killing Kelly had saw him, threw the murder weapon at him, and that's how he got all bloody. And then he ran away after he had panicked, then decided to toss the murder weapon. The prosecutors did provide evidence that put Michael at the crime scene. His DNA was found where Kelly had fled for her life after the first blow to her head. After deliberating seven hours, they found Michael guilty of murdering Kelly Clayton, which the prosecutors call murder hire scheme, and he was sentenced to life in prison with no parole. Beard's attorneys told the judge Thomas Clayton is the predator in this case. His words speak for, for, for themselves. You know, he was a predator in its truest sense, and I think he preyed on just about everybody in his life, um, including Michael Beard, and exploited some of his uh, vulnerabilities and weaknesses. Then next, it was Tom's turn to go to trial, and he pleaded not guilty. The prosecutors knew that they could not use Michael's testimony due to him lying and telling so many stories of what happened that he was not a credible witness to use. They did have many text messages between Tom and Michael, some that read, we have to meet up, and that he was getting Michael a bike. There was surveillance footage that showed from outside Tom's business that Michael was driving the red truck that Tom loaned him, and just hours before Kelly's murder. Investigators believe that you can see him driving the green Surf Pro business truck. Then Tom took the truck to the poker game at the Miller's house, while Michael went over to the house to murder Kelly. He was driving the red truck that was loaned by Tom. Michael's phone was turned off and then back on again, knowing that the cell phones could be traced. Then they showed in trial that the time after her death, you can see Tom's truck being brought back to Tom's business. And then you can see the bike pedaling away in the darkness. They had told the jury that Tom wanted out of the marriage and that also he wanted a payout of his wife's insurance. He knew who he could get to kill his wife. Now, of course, Tom and his lawyer had told the reporters that Michael had acted alone on his own and that Tom did not have anything to do with the murder of his wife. The calls and text message between Tom and Michael just in September, there was 68 times. Tom's lawyer went after the investigators. They had a tunnel vision and they already zoned in on Tom, that it was always the husband. The police had rushed to judgment. Everything in the investigation had been poisoned, he said. Everything was just circumstantial. Also, there was no evidence that Tom had even tried to pay Michael to do anything to Kelly, nor his house. After only six hours deliberation, they had come back with a guilty of first-degree murder. After about six hours of jury deliberation, the jury began deliberating yesterday around 10.40. They zoomed this morning at 9.30, and just shortly before 10 o'clock, they had a verdict. Tom had been sentenced to life in prison with no chance of parole. Now, he did appeal it, and it was denied. Tom is now in Sing Sing Prison in New York. Then Mark, the lookout man, said that he had no idea what at that night what he was looking out for. He had testified against Michael in his role that he was sentenced to three years to six years in prison. As for Charlie and her brother, 
They are with Kelly's sister Kim and her husband and kids. Kim said, those kids, that's what gets me up every day. I got to keep going. She said that she can hear her sister tell her that to keep going, get up. You can do this, and she does it for her sister. Everyone in town really wanted to honor Kelly. Even Tom's old hockey team, Elmira Jackals, they held a tribute to Kelly and for the victims of domestic violence. Kelly's children had dropped the ceremony first puck to the start of the game for their mama. Well, this is it for today's case. Thank you for being here with me. If you'd be so kind, hit the like and subscribe to our channel. It helps us out so much. Until next time, you take care and be safe and make good choices.